Hello, <clears throat> Jim Howard here in Fort Worth, Texas. Today's date, it is November 10th of 2020. In about two hours, it will be November 11th of 2020. November 11th is uh, Veterans Day here in the United States. Let's see um, what it's called. Uh, let's see, on this day, okay. Uh, November 11th is Armistice Day. I guess that's what it's called. No, okay, it says, yeah, it's Veterans Day here in the United States. So this is uh, coming up here in a couple hours, Armistice Day. It's Remembrance Day in the Commonwealth of Nations and it's Veterans Day in the United States. Uh, I went to uh, a Catholic high school that was all male, uh, taught by the Christian Brothers in Kansas City, Missouri. It was uh, De La Salle Military Academy and graduated in 1959. And uh, on Veterans Day, and our school had 500 cadets, we were in uniform all the time, you know, five days a week. Um, we were what was called a 55C school, if I remember correct. That's in the government legislation or rules or wherever it was in that covered the type of school, that, the type of ROTC school that we were. Uh, I never went to a public uh, elementary or high school. So, and so far as uh, the ROTC program in regular schools, high schools, I'm not sure how many times they had, you know, like an hour class. If it was like once a week, you know, two days a week, three days a week, I don't know. But we had it every day. And then on Friday, uh, we came in in dress uniform and uh, had regular classes for half of the day. And then for the rest of the day on Fridays, uh, that was all military. And then we had a full dress while we were in a uh, parade. Uh, there was a city park that was across the street from us. And uh, it ended up being named Parade Park. I think if you'd look it up on Google Map right now, you would see that it's uh, named Parade Park, although De La Salle Military Academy, I forget. Uh, it went a long time, but a few years after I graduated, it went to... Uh, regular, you know, just all-male high school, but without the military. And then eventually it uh, closed completely. So our alumni uh, newsletter and things are handled, I think it's by O'Hara High School. Uh, but for uh, Veterans Day, we always marched in the Veterans Day Parade downtown Kansas City, Missouri. Um, uh, let's see here. I uh, don't remember what, anyway, we were, I'm not sure how many miles it was, but we marched from our school uh, Approximately what, 18th and Pase 18th and Paseo. Was that it? Can't remember now. All the way downtown. So we marched 500 of us, you know, the band, the colors, the whole thing. Then got downtown and formed up and then marched in the actual Veterans Day Parade downtown. I thought that was kind of neat because the other ROTC units 
of course, some of those schools were, you know, way away. But they, you know, they were bused down there, and then they marched, and then the buses drove them back to their school or wherever. I thought it was always kind of neat that we marched down there. But one year we didn't, uh, of those four years that I went. One year, somebody, <laughs> I'm not sure if it was the... Uh, professor of military science and tactics or whatever. That's what that, they were. Uh, U.S. Army, uh, all that, it was an officer and a sergeant. And I think they were, not exactly what they, you know, what, what, they were retired, I believe, but they were, by being, doing that, they were, I don't know, reserve or something. I'm not sure exactly how it worked. And uh, I'm not sure if it was the four years that I was there, I think we had two different uh, officers. And I I know that one of them, Colonel Perry Mee, was, had been in the Bataan Death March and he had made, he had a big magnifying glass if he had to look at something. It, Eyes, you know, were damaged from the uh, being a prisoner of war. I can't remember the other name of the other. I can't remember the name of the sergeant. But uh, each of each of us, we had a M1. You know, so they had 500 M1s without the firing pins in them, and we, you know, we each were assigned one. Uh, so, you know, we marched in the, uh, with an M1, except our officers, you know, had sabers. I'm not sure if any of them have carbines. I think they just had sabers. Well, no, they would have had an M1 assigned to them. I, I think, I, no, I did see some of them that had a uh, carbine assigned to them, I believe. But anyway, we marched in the Veterans Day Parade every, uh, every year. But then this one year, somebody decided, and I'm not sure if it would be the, I'm sure they, whether a Christian brother decided it for some reason, or what the, just decided that they would just uh, have us when we, uh, on the 10th, that we would take our M1s home with us. So, can you imagine, can you imagine today that happening? But I mean, even back then, that was not a good decision, which we got blamed for, but which, I, well, I didn't get, well, we all got blamed, but. So at the end of uh, class, uh, we all, by the way, being a Catholic school, we didn't have a school bus. I, a few times a school bus was, you know, or a bus was rented a few times. Once we were taken to a uh, Army record center and, as a small, you know, different groups, not all 501 bus or several buses or, you know, we went to the Army record center and, uh, which was a military base in Kansas City and uh, for a little bit of orientation. And remember that we had, they had us out in the field, and then they had, you know, we I don't think we were prepared for it. I don't think they told us, but, you know, lined up and looked that way, and then there came, I'm not sure if it was more than one tank, I think it was, but several tanks came at us at high speed. Uh, I think to let us, you know, this is what it would be like, except that's not really what it would be like, but you know, so far as this is what it would be like to be out here and to have a tank charging at you. And then we climbed up on top of the tank. One or two guys dropped their hats, fell on the, uh, over the end, the grating over the engine or whatever they caught, the hats caught fire. Uh, I was actually uh, familiar with the Army Record Center because I was in the, uh, having nothing to do with school and, as far, and I was the only one uh, well, from 
any school that I know, but maybe there was somebody, maybe some of those others were. But uh, I was in the Ground Observer Corps, and that was a uh, affiliate, or I'm not sure what the Air Force called it, but uh, we would, two of us at a time, would go to the Army Records Center and show our ID, and then we would go in, and then we would go in this building up t to the top floor by elevator, and then from there we would go out on like the roof, and then we would climb up a ladder, and there was our post, and then we would watch for Russian aircraft and actually c call it in. Now keep in mind, this is Kansas City, Missouri, the center of the United States. <laughs> so if the Russian airplanes, of course we called in all aircraft that we saw, but if, um, uh, I think kind of pointless. I mean, if a uh, high school student and whoever I, I was with, if we were to look up and see a Russian aircraft, it, I don't think we really needed to call them in. I think maybe I guess we would, uh, at least, you know, and then I guess the uh, command center of the United States Air Force would know that there was also Russian aircraft over, you know, the middle of the United States. But anyway, we would stand a post, I think it was two hours, I believe, or was it longer? can't remember. But I um, wonder if I can pull up. Let's see. GLC. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, Ground Observer Corps. Of course, it'd probably start out with World War One or whatever. Uh, see if they show. There we go. Yeah. This is the pen that we had, and then underneath it would be bars that hang with the number of hours that you had volunteered. And uh, so. Uh, so I was familiar with the post. I had never seen there uh, until that day we went out there with the school. It's the first time I, I think it's the first time I knew they had. Well, we weren't. We were looking up now down. Oh yeah, Ground Observer Corps. So we would be up there, and then when we would see an aircraft, uh, we would pick up. It was a regular phone, just a regular phone like everybody else had. Pick up the phone and dial operator, and then say aircraft flash. And then the operators all knew nationwide uh, what procedure to follow when that happened. And uh, we took priority over every, that, that call. <laughs> They're a high school student, you know. That took priority over everything. The operator, I remember at least once, remember I was in Kansas City, Missouri, at least once I was uh, connected to the Canadian, whatever their. Uh, because they couldn't connect me for some reason to our United States Air Force, whatever the, I can't remember now what the designate, whether it was the one in the, what in the mountain, or I can't remember now where, but anyway, uh, at least once I dialed, you know, and said aircraft flash, and uh, immediately was connected with the Air Defense Command in Canada, and they took the information which was very simple, you know, uh, altitude, direction, whatever it was, a few things, that you, and you filled it in on a log. And uh, so, anyway, back to Deedle Sound Military Academy, Veterans Day Parade, and we took our M1s home with us, and there again, Catholic high school. My parents paid, you know, my parents, of course, all of my, our parents were all paid tax for schools, for public schools. But we went to, uh, the kids who went to Catholic school, the Catholic school charged. And uh, so my parents had to pay again. And uh, we really didn't, my parents really didn't get any 
benefit from, at least for us, from paying the, the tax. So they had to pay tax and they had to pay for the schooling. Um, and I wanted to go to, uh, I think after I was there a while, I think I was thinking, yeah, it would have been better if I'd have gone to Hogan High School because there was girls there. But I, my plan was to, when I graduated, you know, go into the military. <clears throat> when I, after I graduated in 1959, I went down to enlist and uh, they would not take me. I was under the minimum weight requirement. And what I totally forgot about and forgot about for many years, uh, I had hearing loss, which I knew from the first or second grade of grade school, elementary school. And the school, the nuns sent home, you know, a thing that chart or whatever that showed how bad in both ears my hearing was. And I gave them to my parents and my parents never did anything. I'm not saying that I was neglected or anything, you know, else by, by you know, but they just didn't take any action on it. And, and I can't blame them because and when I make, when I became an adult, I didn't do anything. Even when I had health insurance, I just never did anything about it. I just accepted it. But when uh, when a couple years after I was, re you know, the recruiter rejected me in, in 1959, or I think it was 59. I graduated from high school, so I went right down to enlist. I'm not that day or anything, but. Uh, then a couple years later, I was contacted, I was notified that I had to take the selective service physical and went down, there were 200 of us, they got us all naked and uh, the 199, they were out of there by noon, but I couldn't give a urine specimen and I was there till four or five o'clock. So after, at least when it, when it got to be noon, <laughs> They, they let me get dressed. I was there. Uh, I had, you know, I was dressed, but I was there for three or four hours longer. And uh, I kept telling him, "Can I go across the street to the Union Station and get some, get a Coke to drink?" Actually, it was Pepsi then. When I got married at age 26, uh, my wife she had drink Coca-Cola and I drank, uh, no, she drank Pepsi. No, let's see. No, she drank Coke and I drank Pepsi. And when we, then she, so when we got married then she was buying Coke and Pepsi and then I just, okay, just get it, get Coke. Well, I'll go, I'll start drinking Coke. So you don't have to buy, you know, both. But, uh, so anyway, for when I was ordered to go down, take the selective service physical, and uh, then I'd be sent a card. Uh, the draft was in effect, by the way. I would, uh, so I went down, uh, out of 200 of us, I looked like someone from a concentration camp. The, uh, as soon as we got naked, the doctor immediately, and there was like 200 of us all naked, and the doctor came over, you know, and came over to me only. And have you, you know, have you been in the hospital? What, you know, what's wrong? No, 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 I'm fine, you know. And so then they did the blood work and the hearing test, but the hearing test was somebody on the other side of like of a door, and somebody said a word or a number, I think a number, and I could hear that. Uh, and so, so then I, uh, you know, then I went home and a few days later I got a card that said I was 1A, you know, so I went down to enlist and, uh, picked out, okay, here's, I didn't know that you, I didn't know anything about how it worked. I didn't know that you were like, it was like a contract and you should be, and the recruiter really should be, he had a, a quota to get, but he also should be, you know, kind of helping the person out. So he said, well, we have available uh, 
teletype repair. And I said, okay, well, sign me up for teletype repair. And then as we were filling paperwork out and everything, I said, you know, I'm a little bit pissed. Uh, two years ago, I want to, you know, I want to, I want, I want, I want to make a career out of the military and got out of high school, came down and rejected and now here's two years have gone by and now, you know, and he said, what were you, and I said, you know, under the minimum weight requirement, he said, just, just a minute, he said, yeah. So he called over to the uh, place where the physicals were done and then they, I guess they pulled up my record and, oh yeah, okay, we'll send him a new card because they didn't pay any attention to the height and weight. And uh, so then I got a card, one Y, uh, unfit for military service except in the event of national emergency or something. So I didn't get into the military. But anyway, back to school, DSL Military Academy. Um, I, I could have gone a couple buses, you know, public buses to get home. I took the Vine Street bus. If you've ever heard the song, I'm going to Kansas City, get me a bottle of uh, wine, 18th and Vine, or what, uh, whatever. But So I took the Vine Street bus home. I could have taken a different public bus that went around a little bit, you know, and it would have got me home, except I would have been walking through a black neighborhood because I lived in a black neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> I've been walking in a uh, ROT, you know, a military-looking uniform, carrying an M1. <laughs> but this was 19, I, well, when I graduated, it was 1959. It, I walked home a few times. All the way home was through a black neighborhood. From Like I walked from 18th Street where I lived at 35th Street and uh, got stopped a couple of times, but you know, got stopped one time by, uh, I don't know, five or six uh, black, I can't say boys, I guess that's now considered inappropriate, black young men. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure, I think it might have been that colored would be what was used in. But anyway, uh, black young men my age, I was stopped, and they said, have you got any money? And I said, no. And you don't have any change? And I said, no, and I <laughs> patted my pocket. I always had, I always had money in my pocket, you know, cha not, not, you know, change. So I could buy a Coke or buy a Pepsi and uh, candy bars or something. But I patted my pocket and it went jingle, 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 you know, and then I thought, oh, man. and then the couple of the young men said, you do have money. And then I said, I don't know where I came from this either. I never, never picked up my parents cleaning or laundry or something, you know. But I said, oh, well, I've got to pick up my, uh, got to pick up the laundry from my mother. I'm not sure if I said laundry then or cleaning. And then the, one of the young men said, oh, he has to get, he has to pick up his mother's, you know, pick up the cleaning. And so, you know, leave him alone. And so then I, I, so I was never, I never had a problem. Now, after I got out of high school, uh, times were a little bit different. It wasn't the 60s revolution hadn't started, but I was shot at once or twice with a, BB gun or something as I was walking up. So anyway, I I decided that I and I usually took the Vine Street bus to school and home, and I'd be the only uh, white person on the bus. I can't remember. I'm I'm guessing that probably the bus driver was white, but I can't remember now. But I'd be the only white person on the on the bus. I can't remember going home because maybe there was you know people leaving work or something, I'm not sure, but I know in the mornings I was the only white person on the band, like for four years. Uh, but anyway, I decided to take the Vine Street bus home. And as I was 
you know, getting on the bus with the M1, <laughs> and uh, nobody seemed to, as far as I could tell, pay any attention. But as I was looking down the street, I saw the other bus that went down a busier street, 18th Street, I think it was, or was it 16th, Independence Avenue, whatever that was. I could see M1s being pointed out the window, you know, at cars and at people on the sidewalk, and I thought, this is not good. And so then, for that parade downtown, then we reported downtown, you know, with our, you know, we didn't march downtown and we got down however we could and with our M1s marched in the parade and then of course the next day when we went to school, we were, the entire 500 students went to were ordered to report to the auditorium and the Christian brothers, you know, yelled and screamed at us. I don't remember if the uh, army instructors yelled and screamed and hollered at us or not, but the Christian brothers sure did. And I'm sure we were more afraid of the Christian brothers. There was, there was one uh, Christian brother who would, I don't think he did it every day, or I'd have, got, I'd have been uh, beaten to death probably, but um, it'd be in the, does, okay, who, does anybody here not have their homework? Uh, and then he had the, like the thing that you, when you're sitting in your chair, you know, your thing, you have that thing that comes that your paperwork is on everything. One of those things, you know, the wooden things was broken off or something. And then he just went up and down the aisle and hit every cadet, every student. So that was, that was it. Uh, I can remember like, you know, Christian brothers, boys don't, you know, they don't behave like that. They know better than, you know, take, you know. So, Ground Observer Corps. After, let's see, this will tell us, won't it? Uh, tell us when it came to an end here, let's see. I'll put a link to this and to some of these other things. Okay, the second GOC Ground Observer Corps program ended in 1958 with the advent of automated Army and Air Force radar systems. The GOC volunteers were encouraged to continue their service in amateur radio emergency services. Uh, I am an amateur radio operator, but I was not a ham radio operator at that time. But actually, uh, we weren't advised to uh, volunteer for, well, at least, you know, our post. Uh, we were encouraged to join the civil defense program. And, uh, you know, I take that back. We were, okay, they never mentioned amateur radio, but uh, we were trained to be weather observers. Uh, for tornadoes and that type of stuff. And races, the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, that was uh, tied in with, you know, tied in with that. So we were trained to be weather observers, <clears throat> watching for tornadoes and other, you know, storm type things. So at that time I was, you know, I was in the Ground Observer Corps and then it ended in 1958. And uh, I was in the Civil Defense and that was, you know, the 60s, the coming of, you know, that was the Cold War at its height and Kansas City, Missouri Civil Defense. And uh, we, I think it was, I'm not sure if it was monthly, I'm sure at least monthly meetings, you know, we went for those and had some training. I was trained to be a, a radiological monitor. They sent us over to uh, University of Missouri at Kansas City and at, uh, at the college. And we had one day, I think it was, of training on how to use a, uh, you know, the Geiger counter. And our job would have been to, when the nuclear attack took place, <clears throat> at some point we would go outside the shelters, if you could find a shelter, 
and check the radiation levels, and then we could go back and tell the people it's it's uh, safe to go out, or it's not safe to go out, or it's uh, safe to go out, but you don't go that way or something. I don't know, you know. But at at the university, the college, you know, we were in an auditorium for the training, and the college professors come out and they bring out the container, lead container or whatever, and then they open it up and then they take out and all our Geiger counters went. And then the professor says, don't worry, you know, don't worry. And now they were standing up there right next to it. But I was like in the middle of the auditorium and there was a heavy set guy in front of me, a really heavy set. And so I just, I just decided, okay, uh, I think I'll just kind of stay behind him, let him absorb some of the radiation, even though they said it was safe. A uh, few years after that, I, when I couldn't get in the military, I, well, I went to real estate school, graduated from real estate school, and wasn't interested in real estate at all. And then I went to welding school. My father paid for me going to the real estate school, and then he paid for me to go to Ohio to the Lincoln Electric Company for the uh, training in welding. And then I, after that, I came back right away. I went to work as a welder, and I worked in a wrought iron decorative iron shop for a very short period of time. They really didn't need a welder. I did well. I did help them out. They were in a situation when, you know, when I worked there, like, oh, they had this, you know, one of these gigantic posts that they had added on to. Well, they added on to it because I could weld it, but uh, it was tall. It was one of these things you see in a, a, a parking lot, then at the top has some gigantic sign or something. They had the contract for the pipe, and it was like the two brothers owned it. Uh, and I was like, oh hell, you know, how can we rotate this pipe because it's got to be welded all the way around and uh, whatever. And they were, it was, you know, like, uh, and I said, I can weld underneath, and underneath it. So, of course, I mean, you don't just start welding on once, you know, you have to, uh, the heat, well, yeah, you know, but anyway, I welded, you know, I could weld overhead welding on heavy, that's what my welding was really on, you know, welding on heavy, you know, heavy steel. Uh, so I was in civil defense, well, Ground Observer Corps, civil defense, trained as a radiological monitor, uh, trained in light rescue, and some other things. And then I was also, what else? Grand Observer Corps, Weather Observers. Um, anyway, the four years that I was in high school, I, I paid no attention to I was doing extra, I went to, and I was sent to summer school four years in a row because I just didn't pay any attention to carry the books home. A lot of them uh, every day and then carried them to school and never opened them. Uh, and then I was also, uh, a short, my hobby was shortwave listening, but then I was involved in, uh, in high school and after for a little bit, for a short period of time after. Um, like when the United States launched little tiny needles, I don't know how many millions or billions of them up into space, you know, in a rocket, and then that was uh, Operation, I think, Operation Needles, I think. At least that's what, and then I was in charge, there was a research group set up with MIT, Office for Satellite Scatter Coordination, and I was in charge of Research Group C. And then I was also putting out a shortwave listening magazine during that time. 
and uh, then I was doing a radio program for a year. I recorded it at KMBC Radio and Television in downtown Kansas City, and then went, got the, they gave me the tape, and then I went home and uh, mailed it to WRUL Radio New York Worldwide, and it was broadcast three times a week over their five or six frequencies around the world. And I did that for for a year until they cut an item, which they were entitled to, really. But they cut an item out of my uh, show. And so the next week when I recorded it, I said they I put it back in, said that in my opinion they shouldn't have cut it out. And uh, that was the last program for that. So, so Grand Observer. So we've covered the Grand Observer Corps. Let's see here. It sounds like, you know, uh, to news, uh, you know, as soon as uh, President Trump took office, he tried to uh, do away with Obamacare. And so he took Obamacare to the, you know, did a lawsuit. So it went to the United States Supreme Court and they had hearings, or they're, they're not hearings, but they're, you know, getting together and studying everything and the, you know, the arguments in court in the United States Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled that one small part of the uh, Obamacare was not legal or not proper. And uh, because President Trump and the Republicans were trying to do away with Obamacare. And, uh, but the Obamacare continued uh, even with that one part of it being ruled as not proper, not within the law or whatever, but the, so the Republicans spent eight, eight years, not eight years, they spent, uh, they were trying to get rid of the entire time that, yeah, they did, the entire time, time that they, you know, they did. Uh, for the eight years that Obama was in office, the Republicans spent, the Congress, Republican Congress, spent it, uh, the time trying to destroy Obamacare and anything else he had anything to do with and did nothing else, just spent the time trying to just, you know. And then when Trump came to office, then he continued and he, uh, his goal, one of the, his main goals was to do away with Obamacare, and he spent a little bit of time trying to get rid of it. And now here he's, you know, he has, uh, what, 70 days or how many days left before uh, we have President Biden. Uh, and. Trump is trying to get rid of Obamacare, so he's caused, you know, told the Justice Department to file something, and it went to the Supreme Court, and they've had their hearings, and it sounds like they're still having their hearings, I believe, but it sounds as if uh, the Supreme Court is not going to repeal Obamacare, so he he's accomplished nothing. At least that's where we are at this point. But during, you know, all these years, the Republicans, and Trump was big on this, talking about, you know, that the Republican, you know, health care plan. There is no Republican health care plan. There never has been. 
they never drew up something. They just are trying to do away with Obamacare, but they haven't. And, you know, that's the way Trump is. Trump was just saying, you know, we, you know, we have our, we have our plan that's better. And of course, in the beginning, the Republicans were like, oh no, we, you know, we can't have, we can't cover pre-existing conditions. And then finally, the American people, the Republicans figured out the American people, they love, you know, covering pre-existing conditions. And so then the Republicans, well, our plan covers you know, yeah, we in the beginning it was like, you know, oh no, oh no, we're not covering pre-existing conditions. And uh, then before long it was like, oh, well, yeah, our plan covers pre-existing conditions. They don't have a plan, they've not, you know, so. But it looks like that Obamacare is going to be, uh, but what they're going by is uh, they've been broadcasting the, uh, not video, but audio from the Supreme Court hearings. And there's news reporters that are allowed to sit in, you know, in the court. And they can hear the, you know, and you can tell a lot by what the various judges, what questions they ask, and what comments that a judge may make. So it looks like that. Uh, so. Okay, changing subjects. I I use uh, well. Let's use no. It's on the list here. I can show you. So, testing the internet speed. I'll put a link to this. By the way, I went through this before I started this video. Okay, this is the one I've been using. Speedtest.net. Oh wait, I gotta click on this. And they have cluttered this up so much with advertising that I found in this list today. I'm going to use, anyway, here it is. This is the one I use. We pay for 400 meg down and 20 meg up. So paying for 400 down meg and 20 up. Now, you know, I've, I've signed up for this uh, speed test. They don't charge, but they, man, they stick. But uh, here is a uh, results so uh, shows 50 okay here they are you know individual test now there's some times that I came here and I wasn't logged in so those wouldn't show up here but you can see uh, over here the uh, in this column the speed down and here's the speed up. Now, my ex-wife, my, my grown son, you know, lives here. And he has a computer and he's on it. He usually doesn't, he's not using a lot, a lot of bandwidth. But, uh, oh, by the way, here's the best results from that, you know, thing. The, uh, but my ex-wife, you know, she has a computer in it, but she just plays some simple games, you know, on it. Uh, you know, does email, a few things like that. But she has a TV on all the time, like she's watching Game of the Throne over again. She falls asleep with the television on all the time. So there's band, and when I test the things, I mean, I don't try to test. I, I just test when I want to. I mean, I don't try to make sure that bandwidth isn't being used. Oh no, what did I shut down? I hope. Oh, here it is. I shut something else down, I guess. Um, 
So that was feed. Okay. I'm going to write down here in a second because no, maybe I'll just bookmark it. Okay, the next one on the list is, uh, I'll put a link to this, speedof.me, start test, now I'm going to write it down or I'll forget it, you know. Okay, this is, you know, they're, uh, they picked seven of these testing. This is number two, I think. 115 down, 23 up. Delete that. Okay, this one is testby.net. Okay, let's see. Download, you do them separately, I guess. Download speed tests. Correct. I've, I've never had, well, I've, I've had, you know. So. Okay, Xfinity speed test. Start the test. If I start using one of these, uh, let's see. Okay. Internet health test. I think I like this one, at least right now, let's see. Yeah, because the other one is uh, just too many advertisements that, and pops up, you know, pop-ups and stuff, so. I guess this will be, let me copy that, go to start me, go to, I think YouTube, see if I can, add a bookmark, put it here. Okay, hope I can remember where it is, but, so that's that, uh, today, yeah, still today, uh, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll try to put the link to Twit, uh, covered it, although I, especially I think with my hearing problem them talking over the thing. I, I, I just wish I would have, but 
watched this, the actual link or something, but I'll put the link to this, but I'll also put it to Quit where they talk about it, but they had their event today. And they talked about their M1 chip. Uh, it's meant, wow, you know, 16 billion transistors. Uh, it's, they're going to kick, you know, they're going to kick ass. They got, they're now, you know, making their own chips, putting their chips, you know, designing their software, uh, whatever. And it just, their all their devices are, uh, and today I think they announced the, uh, you know, the, you know, the uh, changes to the, I think I'm going to sneeze, MacBook Air, MacBook Pro 13, MacBook Mini, uh, that's the alarm to feed the cat. Um, Anyway, I'll put the link to this, but yeah, they are, uh, and the prices are, you know, prices are pretty reasonable, but uh, I do want to go to Apple after all this time. I've always been a DOS user, you know, and, uh, you know, and, but I think it's time to go to one of the Apple device, you know, to make my change. But I think what I'm going to do is I I may get a really inex, you know, the bottom. Or what I may do is if, and I'm sure they will, if the current uh, products that they have are now now going to be eclipsed by these new Apple devices. But I'd be happy with something that's, you know, old. And so if they're going to discount something, $100 or a couple hundred dollars, I'll uh, get one of those when I can afford it, which I'm not sure when that's going to be. But So I'll put the link to this, so let's see. The news, the speed checks, uh, Armistice Day, Apple's announcement, um, that's it. Let me see if I went down here. I think that's it. So, um, I'll save this, and I'm thinking about doing some live streaming. I've done some a little bit, but I'm thinking about doing more live streaming. Because in the in the past, a few times that I've tried it, at the most I have two, three people uh, at the same time. And that was about, you know, about it. But when I did it uh, last week or something, unannounced, uh, bang, I had quite a few people and had three donations, four donations in that short period of time. And that's the first time I've gotten donations uh, using, uh, you know, YouTube. Now I was around before YouTube. In fact, I was one of the first people to do, be on the internet with video. And I was one of the very first people to do streaming before there was a YouTube or Amazon or any of those. And people made, back then, not a lot of people had cameras. And when I started, you know, the, uh, it wasn't a USB. I don't think USB existed. It was a, a parallel uh, printer port, you know, a US or C, RS-232 port. And it was not in, the camera wasn't color. And I, 
in our progressed or whatever. Anyway, I got a lot of donations, even money donations. A uh, person bought a bicycle for me, had it delivered. A uh, person bought a, a camera for me. I think maybe a couple of different cameras were bought for me. Uh, but then you were considered at that time, if you had a camera, everybody assumed that you were a pervert or whatever. And uh, then eventually, of course, now everybody has cameras and they think it's perfectly, you know, perfectly normal. But uh, anyway, I thank you very much for watching. Uh, please, if you use my links below, like the Amazon links, I get a small commission if you use, if you go to Amazon and then you purchase something. And for the first time, I think this is the first time that I've been with Amazon's affiliate program since they started it. And uh, this month, at the end of the month, I will get $110 from Amazon and commissions. I've never gotten anywhere near most. You have to get at least $10 to even get a commission. And most months, I don't even get a commission, don't even make $10. But this time, somebody has been uh, purchasing items and using, you know, using my link. And uh, so I appreciate it. Please, if you can, use it. It'd be nice to have that extra $100 a month coming in every month. Then I could uh, buy more things to play with and uh, show you. So anyway, thank you very much for watching.